Oh, oh my god, I cannot believe I... Just kidding. Um, kind of like going for a special effects thing there. Some of my students told me that we needed more special effects. So I thought it'd be funny if it looked like I stabbed myself with my pointer. Did I scare you? Uh, I guess not. Okay, so next video we were talking about today is Jackson. Oh, how I do love some Jackson. In class, I introduced you to Jackson using this handout, and I told you that it's, it's going to be coming, that his biography seems to shape his beliefs and therefore what, how he actually behaves in office. So I'm trying to make this tie that the way you brung up affects the way you think about things, affects the way that you um, act in office in your official capacity. So um, remember I said you brung up. I'm, I'm talking a little bit about uh, Andrew Jackson as a, as a new political force because he's from the West and he has kind of a backwoods manner at times. Um, and so he's a, he's a new element in politics. He's not one of the East Coast elites. Okay, So we've talked about his upbringing, we've talked about the election of 1824 and the controversies in which John Quincy Adams became president. We've talked about how Adam, how Jackson got his revenge over Adams in 1828 by starting the Democratic Party and um, coming up with new ways of campaigning, really revolutionizes campaigning. So what we're going to move on to now is the back of that sheet that talks about uh, three different crises he faced and what he did about them. Okay, so let's turn our attention to the PowerPoint and figure out what, what it is Jackson uh, what positions he takes on the um, South Carolina tariff crisis, the um, National Bank crisis, and Indian uh, problem. Okay, so moving on to the PowerPoint. All right, so we have a, a problem with the tariff of, of abominations. It's called the tariff of abominations by the South Carolinians, of course. They think by abominable they mean it's, it's horrible. And the question is, why doesn't South Carolina want to pay the tariff? And hopefully by now, the, this is pretty easy for you to understand, that they don't want to pay the tariff because they import more stuff, because they don't have a lot of factories down in the South, and therefore a tax on imports hurts them more. And so they consider it to be a tax that's unfair to Southerners, and they want to pull out the old nullification idea of the Kentucky and Virginia Resolves that Madison and Jefferson came up with. They want to nullify the tariff. And in fact... The president's vice president is John Calhoun from South Carolina. And John Calhoun is the one who writes in his South Carolina exp exposition this, this idea that he uh, can lead the South Carolinians to nullify the tariff. And he says if they can't nullify the tariff, then they should secede or withdraw from the union. So this is quite a showdown between the president and his own vice president within his own party. And there's a lot of questions about, well, what... What position is Jackson going to take? He is a Southerner, born in North Carolina or South Carolina, not quite sure which one, but then went to Tennessee. He is a Southerner, but at the same time, he is certainly not one to want to give up power, and he is the representative of the federal power over the states. So, what we have is a quote on your piece of paper. Okay, Jackson's quote related to this is, Our federal union, it must be preserved. So based on that famous quote which he gave on uh, July 4th when he finally made his decision, hopefully you can tell from that quote that he says South Carolina must pay the tariff, that they cannot nullify federal law. And in fact, uh, his own Vice President Calhoun resigns over this after Jackson threatens to hang him if he continues this nullification and secession uh, uh, way of thinking. So the resolution is not, you might think that the resolution is that we start the Civil War, but it's too early for that. After all, it's only the uh, 18, late 1820s, early 1830s. So you know it's not time for Civil War, so instead, you know, there must be some kind of resolution. And the resolution is that after South Carolina rebels and threatens to secede, and Jackson threatens to use the army, okay, so the, things are really escalating towards a point of, of um, violence and military intervention, Henry Clay, the marriage counselor, remember him? He's going to come in riding on his white horse, and he's going to propose a compromise. The compromise is going to lower the tariff gradually over 10 years, and that gives everyone some political cover, okay? Hopefully you can see this. So it allows Jackson to say, ha, 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 I got the South to back down, and they are going to pay the tariff. And it got the South Carolinians so they could say, well, see there, in 10 years we are going to get rid of the tariff. So both sides of this, oh my goodness, I've got to quit shaking the table. Um, both sides of this escalation can claim at least some victory through this compromise. So yay for Henry Clay, won the day yet again through compromise. 
an important element of saving and advancing the American democracy is always compromise. Okay. So, the next thing that we have that's a problem for uh, Andrew Jackson and uh, his contemporaries is about the National Bank. Now, let's recall why the National Bank is controversial. Okay, let's just remember. So, the National Bank has been controversial since its founding. Alexander Hamilton said we needed a National Bank to make a stable currency and also in keep the wealthy people invested, um, excuse the pun, uh, in the success of democracy. Well, the National Bank is still controversial. Here's what goes on. The wealthy who uh, manage the bank, they still are accused of printing too little money. And so um, those who have money, their money is worth a lot. But those who have debts and need to get money to pay their debts say that there's an underprinting of money going on. Um, the common people also feel like the National Bank gives uh, better lending terms to people of wealth than they do the common people. And so they feel, uh, common people feel discriminated against. Kind of like if, if a rich person comes in and needs a loan, they get good treatment and low interest rates and those kinds of things. But if poor people, God forbid, want a loan, that they don't get quite the same treatment nor the same um, advantageous interest rates. So this national bank has always been controversial between the elite and the common man. Now, Andrew Jackson has to figure out what's, what's his position going to be. Okay? He is both a wealthy man and at the same time a, um, and not one who uh, eschews power. But he also is a southerner and um, a frontiersman, so he has kind of a common man sensibility to him as well. So his position on the bank is not that clear until you think about the fact that politics is always personal to him, and there's one person who very much likes the bank, and that is Henry Clay. And think back in your little heads about does Jackson like Henry Clay or not? Jackson hates Henry Clay, because Henry Clay helped steal the election of 1824. Uh, by um, supporting John Quincy Adams and getting the House of Representatives members that he influenced to support John Quincy Adams. So, once you know that Jackson hates Henry Clay and Henry Clay likes the bank, then you know Jackson's going to hate the bank because um, that's the way politics is to Jackson. Okay. Now, the question is, how is he going to justify that position to the common people? And it shouldn't be hard because they already have um, a position against the bank. So, the bank comes up for renewal. Should he renew it before it expires? And his quote is, the bank is trying to kill me, but I will kill it. So, it's pretty clear he thinks the bank is against him. So, he kills the bank by refusing to renew the charter to the bank. He actually does even better than that. He takes the money out early. He has to hire and fire three different secretaries of the treasury because nobody thinks this is legal to do this, to actually take the money out of the bank early without um, an act of Congress. But he does. He eventually finds a secretary of the treasury that will do the dirty deed for him. And so we get what's known as the bank war. Jackson takes the money out of the national bank and he puts the money in the state banks that are owned by his friends. Again, politics is personal to this man, and they become known as pet banks. The problem with the pet banks is they do what the banks have always done when they are told to uh, manage the currency. They get the money, and then they start overprinting currency. They're given so much gold, and they're told to only print as much currency as there is gold. But we all know banks make money by loaning money, so they have an incentive to overprint money, to loan it out and make interest on it. And they assume that everyone won't show up at the same time to get the gold that is represented by the money. So they take a gamble. But the problem with this overprinting of currency is that it starts to make... Let me back this up. Okay, suddenly it becomes clear to people over time that, hey, there's a lot more money in the economy all of a sudden. There's currency flying around. And it occurs to people that some of the banks must be cheating and they must be overprinting money understandable since this has been an ongoing situation for uh, since the beginning of the republic now. So suddenly people don't want the money anymore. They all know it's worthless and if you probably take it back to the bank and ask for the gold they're not going to have the gold. So people become real nervous about taking currency including the federal government. Suddenly the federal government doesn't want to um, accept paper currency anymore because they know it's not that valuable either. So Andrew Jackson issues this species circular. He spent, sends around this um, message specie being gold and he says, hey, hey, the federal government doesn't want paper money anymore in payment for federal debts. We only want gold. So what do all the people do? They take their paper currency and they go back to their banks and they say, hey, um, we really need the gold for this paper currency. We can't really um, use the paper anymore. Do the banks have enough gold? 
No, because they've cheated and they've printed too much paper currency, more currency than they have gold on hand. So the banks have to be like, um, we're closed today. <laughs> and this leads to a major panic because it's clear that things are not exactly right in the economy um, related to the currency issue. So they overprint money. Andrew Jackson issues this specie circular saying the government will only accept gold, not paper money, for payment of debts. And so the long-term result is that we get a panic. In 1837, people rush to the banks to get their gold. The banks don't have enough gold for the amount of currency they've printed. And so unemployment goes up, so people lose jobs because banks aren't there to make loans to help support small businesses. And ironically, this doesn't even get blamed on Jackson which it totally should, right? Jackson's the one who killed the bank. Jackson's the one who issued the specie circular. So everyone should be pointing at Andrew Jackson as the big problem. But of course they don't. Because by the time this all trickles down through the economy and comes to this awful result, he's not president anymore. Martin Van Buren is president. His vice president, his good friend, friend and buddy, Martin Van Buren, he's now president and everyone blames it on him. Because they don't really understand how this complex economic thing tumbled downhill until it became a crash. So they call Martin Van Buren, handily enough, Martin Van Ruin, and he is a one-term president. So, Andrew Jackson really never gets the full blame for what he did to the economy by killing the National Bank. Okay? The final problem that Jackson has to deal with is what he calls the Indian problem. The Indians are a problem in so much as they're on land in the southeast that white Americans really want. We're talking in the, uh, the Georgia area. Southeast Georgia, Alabama, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina area. The Cherokee, though, are very innovative. They try and resist this discrimination by Americanizing. And the Cherokee, actually, their women begin dressing like um, other uh, American women. They farm on plots of land. They produce a newspaper uh, and a language that is um, determined by a famous Native American named Sequoia. So it, the first line of defense for the Cherokee is to just act more like white people and hope that white people therefore accept them and let them stay on their land. But unfortunately, that's not exactly what happens. Jackson's position is that he supports the removal of the Native Americans, and he passes what's known as the Indian Removal Act in 1830. And he wants to move all the Native Americans west of the Mississippi River to what he calls one big reservation in the Central Plains, and um, they'll all go there and live. Of course, the Cherokee, since they are so Americanized, they decide to resist in a new way. Instead of going on the war path or things like that, instead, they decide to um, go to the Supreme Court and see if the Supreme Court will recognize their, their land claims to the land that they have lived on. The court case is called Worcester versus Georgia. And Marshall, John Marshall, yes, he is still the Chief Justice, he actually backs the Cherokee, and he says that they have kind of a nation within a nation status, and that they have a right to stay. And that's when we get Jackson's famous quote, which is, Marshall has made his ruling, now let him enforce it. Okay, let's talk about what he means by that. Jackson disagrees with the Supreme Court, and he knows that he has an army, the Supreme Court doesn't have an army, okay? It's up to the president to enforce the law. It's up to the judicial branch to declare what laws are constitutional and which ones are not. But Jackson calls it a bluff. He says, I want the Native Americans to move, and I know most Congress, most of Congress wants the Native Americans to move. So judicial branch, sorry, you're outnumbered two to one. You don't have an army to enforce what you're saying, so I'm just going to ignore the Supreme Court and move the Native Americans west anyway, and there's nothing you can do about it. And this is where John Marshall has kind of a, a major lapse in judgment. He should have seen this coming. But this is where the judicial branch learns a very difficult lesson. The judicial branch can never go out on a limb all by itself, okay? If they are going to make a controversial ruling, they have to be sure that either Congress or the president is willing to go out on that limb with them, or that limb's going to break and they're going to be sent off uh, on their own looking stupid, okay? For example, let me give you a modern example. The Supreme Court went out on a limb when it, in 1954, said that black children could go to school with white children. 1954 was a little early for most Americans to accept this basic premise that segregated schools are unequal. So the judicial branch walks out here on its little limb all by itself, okay? And then there's a lot of resistance, and a lot of people don't want to integrate the schools. So the question is, 
who's going to go out on that limb with the judicial branch? And it just so happens that Dwight D. Eisenhower is president at that time. It's clear that Congress isn't going to do anything about supporting this ruling because uh, still the majority rules in Congress and the majority of Americans aren't quite ready to accept integration in the schools. So what happens is, and what's key, is that Dwight D. Eisenhower comes out on this limb with the judicial branch and he sends the army to integrate uh, the first uh, high school in the, in the United States. So before the judicial branch can make a really controversial ruling, they need to make sure that one branch of government is with them, okay, either the president or the Congress. Andrew Jackson, in this case, just totally ignores the Supreme Court. And normally what would happen if the president refuses to enforce the law, he can be impeached. Congress could come out here with the judicial branch and impeach the president for breaking the law. But Jackson knows Congress isn't going to do that. So the judicial branch is out here all by themselves, and no one's coming to rescue them, and bolt, he just breaks the judicial branch off, and he does what he wants to anyway. Okay? So this is a really important moment for the Supreme Court, that they can be ignored if they don't have somebody to get their back. And Jackson is aware of that, and that's what he uses to his advantage in this decision. So he ignores the Supreme Court. The Native Americans are sent west anyway. This leads uh, to a massive removal of the Native Americans. They go 800 miles to Oklahoma, mainly on foot. This is overseen by the army. Over a quarter of them die. Now, North Carolina has an interesting heritage related to the Cherokee. Some of those Cherokee didn't want to go. So what they decide to do is to hide out in the mountains. And in North Carolina, they hide up into the mountains and where the army can't find them. And they, they stay. And so if you go to the Cherokee Indian Reservation now, in west or about an hour west of Asheville, they have a Cherokee reservation there largely because a lot of Cherokees resisted removal and hid out in the mountains. And that's why their outdoor uh, drama is called Unto These Hills. They think that the hills really protected them and helped them um, resist this terrible um, reality of their, their history. Now what's really ironic about that is while the Cherokee resisted and stayed in the mountains and they now have a reservation there, guess what county their reservation is in? Jackson County. How ironic is that, right? So Jackson moves the Native Americans west. Some of them resist. That's why there's a Cherokee reservation in North Carolina. But strangely, it's in Jackson County. All right. The Cherokee that weren't so lucky that went west um, did not necessarily prosper on that trip, and a quarter of them do not survive. And here is a map that shows you basically what a uh, removal looked like. You can see Native Americans leaving Georgia, Alabama, even down here in, in Florida. Some Seminoles were removed, and they all go westward to the Oklahoma area. Okay? Here's um, some famous paintings of the Trail of Tears. And then this is what we're going to return to in class, which is back to biography and policy. So what policies that we've just talked about show he's against privilege? What policies show he sees politics as personal? And what policies show that he is simultaneously for and against nationalism? So after this discussion today, hopefully you have a better sense of what you're going to put on the front of that sheet under manifested actions. Okay? So thanks for attending to this discussion. And I look forward to seeing you in class, and we'll talk more about the front of the sheet about manifested actions and see if you can process what all we have talked about in this um, discussion, or lecture, I guess, to be more accurate. All right, see you.